Let's take our Bibles and turn to Luke 22. And in Luke 22, I'd like to start reading in verse 39. It says that he came out and went, as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, why sleep ye? Rise up and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you've allowed us to be here. We, you, that you've uh, made it possible, that you've uh, 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 given us the means to travel, that you've given us a place where we can gather but most importantly, that you put the desire in our heart that we would gather here to worship you. We ask as we're gathered here that you would meet with us, that you would speak to us, that you would strengthen, that you would comfort, that you would rebuke. Make this sermon everything that you would have it to be. Take it in whatever direction you would have it to go. Let me not stand in the way. Let no, let no one stand in the way of what you would have preached here today. Lord, we would ask that you would forgive me of my sins and allow me to be the vessel by which this message would be preached. We pray that if there is someone here who does not know Christ as their Savior, that they would trust in him fully and enter into the kingdom. Whatever is done, Lord, we want to magnify you. We pray that you would be well pleased. We pray these things in the name of your precious Son, that you would receive the honor, the praise, and the glory. Amen. 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 I'd like to preach this morning, was there any other way? Was there any other way? Back when uh, we were going to church in Williamsburg, Ohio, uh, I believe it was a choir song uh, that we used to sing. Was there any other way? And the question during the verses would ask if that, that very question or during the verses and then during the chorus, it would say, no, there was no other way. There was no other way that we might be saved. There is no other way that we might be forgiven of our sins. There's no other way that we might enter into the presence of the Father, but through Jesus Christ. Christ himself. was asking the Father, if thou be willing, remove the cup from me. But if not so, not my will, but thine be done. 
Christ went to the cross. Christ died for our sins. Christ was buried and rose again. And in spite of what anyone says and what anyone well, teaches or anyone that's offended by this, Christ is the only way to be saved. Amen. We heard Brother Mills uh, uh, in his sermon testify a few months ago that there in Trinidad that it is illegal to make that statement. I am thankful that we live in a country where we can still proclaim that Christ is the way to heaven. It is the way of the cross that leads home. That old dear song that we sing. Man has always tried to find another way other than God's way. Man has always looked to his own devices and his own wisdom and all manner of things that he might enter into the presence of God. Christ went the way of the cross. Christ walked the street called the Via Dolorosa. Did not turn back. As we preached not too long ago, he didn't come down off of the... Why? Because the stakes were too high. If you study the scriptures, we understand that Christ didn't look forward to the cross but he looked forward to afterwards, the glory that he would receive. He looked forward to our salvation. And yet men look for another way. The, 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 the debt was entirely paid for us. Salvation is the free gift of God given to us by grace, through faith. Yet men will look for another way. Been watching some stuff here in the last few weeks. A clip from the old Oprah Winfrey show where she was pressing someone Opposing someone because they said that Christ was the only way to heaven. Have you all heard of Rick Warren? Rick Warren back, uh, I guess it's been a little while now. Wrote a, a book that made him famous, The Purpose Driven Life. Offered a program in a lot of churches around the country, perhaps around the world, bought this program. That they would be purpose driven. Used to be on the Larry King show all the time. Larry King would refer to him as America's pastor. Saw video clips where he claimed that there was other ways. He didn't, want to, he didn't want to just relegate heaven to just one way. My Bible says that Christ is the only way. Amen. I was going to save these verses to the end, but I'm going to say them now. I feel led to say them now. Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said that I am the door. If we are to enter in, we must go through Christ. Proverbs 16, 25 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. That is the only way that we can be healed. 
That is the only way that we can have peace with God. That is the way that our transgressions can be blotted out and our iniquities can be forgiven. Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. But as I said, man has always looked for another way. Back in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, had life. They, they, they were never, at that point, subject to death, pain, or disease. Aren't you thankful that Adam and Eve did what they did? As we look at our long prayer list, as we hear about all the things around us and the sickness and the disease and the pain and the suffering and the crime and all those things. Because man is a sinner. Here was Adam and Eve in a sinless, perfect environment. And the devil comes along. And he confronts Eve and he asks her some questions. And he makes some statements. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast in the field and which the, the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the, the, the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, number one, the devil already knew the answer to the question. Be very leery when people ask you questions that they're... That they're, that when, when they're, when they're uh, trying to point you in a, a certain direction. And what he was trying to point out is not all the trees that they were allowed to eat from, but the one that they weren't. That's where we run into trouble. It's not considering what we have. It's when we consider what we have not. When, when, when we... want the thing that God has not given us. And as we see, they were better off without it. God does not withhold anything from us that is good for us. It is only that which is bad. So he puts the question in her head. He directs her to the thing that she's not allowed to have. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. You know what? They surely died. She didn't drop dead that second, but they died. You read any of these gene genealogies as you go through. It tells you who they were born and then they died. They were born and then they died. Uh, you, you look uh, here in the book of Genesis, it'll do that. In the books of the Chronicles, and they died, and they died, and they died. It's all because of sin. Because man sought a different way than the way that God had provided for him. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Here was the promise that was made. Ye shall be as gods. Now, some years ago, I guess the, I guess it, it, it grew some in the seventies, and, and, and by the eighties, it had it had bloomed in the nineties. Don't hear as much of it as you did back then, but you still hear it. Of it. Ye shall be as gods. That is what the New Age movement was all about. Now,
in our day, we, we're seeing the rise of atheism. It's the same concept. Man is making himself his own God. Man is proclaiming that there is no God, and if there is no God, then he must be God. That we can do what we want. That we can accomplish anything that we want. The New Age movement taught that. Mormonism teaches that. The big selling point in Mormonism is that you will ascend to Godhood if you're a good Mormon. A good Mormon is somebody who leaves the Mormon church and gets saved. That's a good Mormon. That's the only good Mormon. But if you're a good Mormon and you follow their rules and you follow their laws and you do all the, the things that they require you to do, you should be a God. Scientology, Hinduism, all these religions of the world teach the prominence of man. James 2.19 says, Thou believest there is one God, thou dost well, the devil's also believe and tremble. Many of these religions believe in a God, but they don't believe in the way to God, the true way to God. You might recall Herod, uh, King Herod, in, in, in the book of Acts, chapter 12. And we won't take the time to turn there, but it's found in uh, verses uh, 21 to 23. I believe I've got written there, if I could read my own writing. But he's making a speech, and he's standing there. And the people were overwhelmed by his ability to speak. And they said, oh, it's like the voice of a God. And he got lifted up. In pride in himself. It says, and instantly he was eaten of worms. I've, I've pictured in that, my, that in my head over years where the worms inside of him, they eat their way out, or, 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 or what happened, whatever happened, it wasn't good for old Herod. In Isaiah, maybe we will take the time to go to that one. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, verses uh, 12 through 16. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. In the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. See, Lucifer knew that temptation. He brought that same thought, that same concept into the Garden of Eden. The promise was that you should be like gods. And, and, and as I said, nowadays the, the easiest way of doing that to them is just take God out of the equation. He said, ye shall be like gods knowing good and evil. We preach knowledge in this day. We preach education and I'm not against knowledge and I'm not against education by any means. But the problem is we have knowledge, we have education, but we have no wisdom. We don't have wisdom. We know so much anymore about the universe. You know, we've got our Hubble telescopes and we've got, we, we've got all these things. We, we know about DNA that uh, men would... And it's funny, when you read the Bible, you can see that God knew these things all along. But we know so much about our universe and our bodies and everything else. But we don't understand 
your creator of all those things. We don't understand the one who created the universe. We don't understand. And I'm not talking about the saved. I'm talking about our society. We don't understand the one that created us. We live in a society where it's okay to murder the unborn. We live in a society where we're not allowed to preach and teach morality to our young or to anyone if certain people have their way. And then we wonder why we see the crime rate raised. We wonder why we see teenage pregnancies, drug addiction, all these great things that we're suffering from. You know, you hear about the opioid and the heroin uh, 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 crisis. We hear about kids growing up in homes where they never knew their father. We hear about the, the, the teen pregnancies and all these other things. We've got so much knowledge and so little wisdom. Knowledge is not a bad thing. God told Hosea the people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Seek knowledge. Seek knowledge. But make sure you do it with God's wisdom. Man's knowledge is apart from God. Romans 1.21-2 says, They professed themselves to be wise, but they became as fools. Once again, in the book of Isaiah. I should just stay there, shouldn't I? The book of Isaiah, chapter 55 this time. Verses 8 and 9. The Lord said this, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, or your ways, my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and as my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. According to Psalms 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And a good understanding have all they that do his commandment, his praise endureth forever. In Acts 17, all the philosophers of the day would, would gather on Mars hills, the, the Epicureans and the, the, the Stoics, and they, they had all their opinions. And all the opinions of everyone else doesn't matter. A friend of mine, Brother Kevin Ritter, Back in the 90s, he's a young man. Pray for his son, by the way. His son has had uh, multiple brain surgeries. They're trying to uh, rid this, this child of uh, um, seizures. And he's had several surgeries trying to remove whatever the problem is. And uh, he just had one in the past week. So please pray for him. But, but Kevin Ritter is a, a young man. Uh, probably wasn't, it was still in his teens. He was calling all the churches around Cincinnati to, to get an opinion. Do you think homosexuality is a sin? And he got a hold of this one, one guy on the western side of town, and uh, the pastor said, it doesn't matter what I think. The Bible says it's a sin. When we start to understand it doesn't matter what we think, it doesn't matter what our opinion is, all we have to go on is the Word of God, and the only thing we can rely on is the Word of God 
all these other things, we, we, we can have all the knowledge, but then we start to have wisdom. Paul preached there on Mars Hill to those people, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Many believed. Many said, well, well, we'd like to hear more about this. But people tried to find salvation through wisdom. The creator of Star Trek uh, back in the day, back in the 60s, his idea was, we're going to have a society where all those problems are going to be uh, abolished just because of the goodness of man and because uh, we will achieve this because we gather together and the nations will reunite and all our problems will be solved. Jesus said that he was the only way to heaven. That we would not save ourselves. By knowledge, by achieving godhood, by our good works. Which comes up to the next person. In Genesis chapter 4 verses 2 through 5, we read about the first brothers. Cain and Abel. It says that in the process of time, it came to pass that, that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto God. And Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But to Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Here we have the first case of man trying to please God by his works. God had told man that there had to be blood shed. Hebrews said without the Shedding of blood. There is no remission. That the wages of sin is death. So Cain brought from the field the things that he had worked, the, the things that he had sweated. It wasn't an easy thing. He had sweated and, and worked the ground. He didn't have the modern farming tools that we have. And he brought forth his offering and he thought, God's going to be pleased with this. Probably even brought the best he had. God is going to be so pleased. Cain brought the works of his hands. But Abel brought a spotless lamb. That was God's method. That was God's plan. That is what God had approved. Cain can take pride in his ability to grow beautiful fruit. But Abel could sorrow that one so perfect was slain for his sins. It should break your heart that the perfect spotless Lamb of God was slain because of your sins, because of your iniquities, because of your transgressions. When you realize that, you'll quit trying to present your works to God. Your filthy, ragged righteousness to God. And you'll just accept and glory in what God has done for you. Cain trusted his work, but Abel trusted in God's word. When you believe God, when you believe God, that makes all the difference. He believed that God, the word that God spoke. Today we have the word that God wrote to believe in. And we also understand that Christ is the living word of God. Cain gave God his best. Shouldn't God have cut him some slack? Abel, Abel accepted God's best. It's not 
of works of righteousness that we have done. But it is of the shedding of blood of Jesus Christ. That is the only way to heaven. It's funny that Cain was surprised, was he not? God had said, I, I, you know, you, you need to make a sacrifice. You know, we need a blood sacrifice. And then when God rejected the sacrifice he gave, Cain was surprised. I'll just do it my own way. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. We read of those who proclaim to know Christ as their Savior. They're going to be surprised because they've done all the works. They were members of churches. They were baptized. They took part in the service. Maybe read their Bibles. Did all sorts of things. And God said to them, the Lord said, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. The only way to heaven is that blood sacrifice, the bloodless, spotless lamb, Jesus Christ. Now, I, I touched on this a few minutes ago, but we'll bring it up again. We get to Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. And we read in the Tower of Babel. It says the whole earth was one language and one speech. They all got together there in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. They had their big cities. And they decided they were going to build this tower. Let us build a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They had it all planned out, but God says the Lord came down. The Lord came down and he confused their languages. I was seeing something the other day that was talking about, you know, the... Here in America, we don't speak English. And it was a quote that was uh, attributed, to, and they didn't know who quite said it, that uh, America was a two nations separated by a language. And sometimes even dialects can be different. When Pi and I were first married, we, first, we had some miscommunications. Because the way I pronounce things and the way she pronounced things. Can you imagine someone with a completely different language? But their thought was the same thought that we have today, and we call that humanism. The brotherhood of man. Most of the world salutes and thinks, what a great work of art. John Lennon's song, Imagine, is about the brotherhood of man. Just imagine how it will be when we, when we put aside all of our differences and just be good for goodness sake and, and, and men just love each other and, and, and uh, no more fighting and what all we can accomplish when we do that. They started out in the early 1900s with the League of Nations. That failed miserably and then they reinstituted the United Nations. That's not stopped war. That's not stopped pain. That's not stopped hunger. It's not stopped anything. They're trying to create heaven on earth. They're trying to create a utopia in everything they do is marred by the fall of man. The internet has come along and, and it's joined us that way and we can get all these ideas, but the internet is used by foul and wicked people. Jeremiah said in chapter 17, verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who could know it? Was there any other way? Remember where we started out in this sermon? Here Jesus is in an agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. He instructed his disciples to pray. 
lest they enter into temptation. He did that at the beginning of our passage. He did it again at the end of our passage. They were asleep. They were seeking their own comfort. The Lord was about to die in agony. And all they could care about was they were tired. They were miserable. They didn't want to get out of their comfort zone. They didn't want to suffer. Yet Christ died for them anyway. They were unable, or at least unwilling, to overcome. The weakness of their flesh. And Christ had to admonish them that they were going to enter into temptation if they did not pray. If they were not faithful to the things that He had given them to do. We think sometimes we suffer so much until we think about how much He suffered for us. Was there any other way? There was no other way, and that's why He did it. And he loved us enough that He did it. That any man, woman, boy or girl that will come to Him in faith and believe in Him and trust in Him would not have to enter into hell. Would be forgiven of their sins and enter in the presence of the Father someday. Amen. That is the way. And that is why He did it. If there was another way, He surely wouldn't have done it. He asked the Father, is there any other way if you're willing? But He died that I might have eternal life. Won't you stand?